สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're in our Pali Canon in English Study Group. We're in Volume 6, which is titled The Natural Law of Gamma. We're studying chapters 31 through 40. What we do in this class is we read a chapter of this book, and then I share teachings on it, and then help you with any questions that you might have. You can ask questions by putting those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions directly, and I'll be able to answer the questions that you have. This program is more of a study group for students who already have a really good foundation of the teachings of the Buddha on the path to enlightenment. And now what we're doing is we're studying the original words of the Buddha to help you fill in the framework or the foundation of your foundation of the path to enlightenment. So we're going to move right into chapter 31 today. And if there's anyone who would like to read this, you're welcome to. I'll go ahead and read the chapters. And then from there, I'll share some teachings and then open up to any questions that you guys might have. This particular chapter 31 is titled, A Great Gift. Monks, here a noble disciple, having abandoned the destruction of life, abstains from the destruction of life. By abstaining from the destruction of life, the noble disciple, excuse me, the noble disciple gives to an, un, to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, hostility, and harm. He himself in turn enjoys immeasurable freedom from fear, hostility, and harm. This is the first gift, a great gift, highest of long standing, traditional, ancient, untainted, and never before tainted, which is not being tainted and will not be tainted, not refused by wise aesthetics in Brahmins. This is the stream of merit, stream of the wholesome, nutriment of peacefulness, heavenly, ripening, peacefulness, conducive to heaven, that leads to what is aspired for, needed, and agreeable, to one's welfare and peacefulness. The other four precepts, which are abstaining from taking what is not given, abstaining from sexual misconduct, abstaining from lying, and abstaining from consuming intoxicants, substances that cause heedlessness, are repeated with the Buddhist guidance. These are monks, these five gifts, great gifts, highest, of long standing, traditional, ancient, untainted, and never before tainted, which are not being tainted, and will not be tainted, not refused by wise aesthetics and Brahmins. Okay, so this teaching here, the Buddha is essentially pointing to the five precepts and helping you understand that by practicing those, that you are eliminating this fear, hostility, and harm from your own mind, as well as providing this immeasurable amount of freedom from fear, hostility, and harm to other beings. Taking this first one that he's talking about here, which is the first precept, where in the first precept, he talks about abandoning the destruction of life and living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. If you chose to do that, then you're giving this freedom of fear, hostility, and harm to others because you're not going around actively killing other beings. So therefore, they can live without fear of this death or any hostility or harm coming to them. And because you're choosing to do that, you're not putting out harm to others, so therefore harm isn't coming to you. So you enjoy this immeasurable fear of freedom from hostility, I'm sorry, freedom from fear, hostility, and harm. Because whatever you're choosing to do, your choices and decisions are leading to some result. That's what the natural law of gamma is, is cause and effect or action and result, the results of your decisions. It's your life, your decisions, and your results. So if you're choosing to not kill and other beings are now having this freedom of fear, hostility, and harm, then you get to experience that same benefit because nobody's going to be coming to try to kill you when you're not trying to kill others. <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me, then the Buddha goes through and he talks here some about this peacefulness that choosing to practice in this way, one gets to this ripening of peacefulness, conducive of heaven, and that one then aspires and 
acquires the things that are needed and agreeable to one's welfare. This is going to help you in daily life because by you practicing in this way, the Buddha is saying if there's rebirth, there's an improved rebirth. But just remember that the goal of the teachings of the Buddha are not to be reborn. That's not the ultimate goal of this path to enlightenment. Instead, the ultimate goal is to train your mind and get to this enlightened mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing any discontent feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. Even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the enlightened mind. So while the same things that are leading to your enlightenment, they also lead to rebirth in an improved existence should you need to be reborn. So if you apply all the effort and energy, dedication and determination towards enlightenment in this life, and you fall short of that for any reason, you will still experience an improved rebirth in your next life. But the ultimate goal would be to get to enlightenment in this life. So the Buddha is just mentioning this as part of his teachings, and he talks about this in other parts of his teachings as well. And then, of course, we're just consolidating this so we didn't put in all the precepts, but he's pointing to the other four precepts too, because it's the same thing. If you're not causing harm, then harm isn't coming to you. So by you choosing to abstain from taking what is not given, which is essentially stealing, by you abstaining from sexual misconduct, which is causing harm through your sexual conduct, by you abstaining from lying and abstaining from taking intoxicants and substances that cause heedlessness, you're not causing harm to other beings, so therefore harm isn't coming to you. And that's what the Buddha's talking about here. And he's casting it and describing it as these gifts, because oftentimes when we learn certain things, we may or may not be willing to do this certain thing for ourselves. Oftentimes people struggle with doing good things for themselves. They think they might be selfish, but that's not the truth. If you're making wise decisions that are producing wholesome results in your life, this isn't selfish of you. This is wise decision making. So oftentimes people are more inclined to do things for other people versus themselves. So here the Buddha is explaining that by you practicing the five precepts, you're giving these five great gifts, these highest gifts, these long-standing gifts that you're giving other beings the freedom of fear, hostility, and harm by you choosing to practice abstaining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying in substances that cause heedlessness. So it's very wise to be able to practice the five precepts. When some people learn the five precepts, they think of them as rules or commandments, but that's not the way that I think about them at all. And the Buddha sh certainly didn't teach him that way. Instead, when he taught the five precepts, he was helping you to understand the natural law of gamma through these precepts so that then you can have wisdom about what would be wise for you to make decisions in terms of these five impactful decisions that you could make in the world. He's not giving you rules or commandments to follow. He's not, you know, dictating things to you that you would then be feared or punished or guilt or shamed into practicing any particular thing. Instead, he's showing you the wise decision making of eliminating killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying in substances that cause heedlessness, that by you choosing to eliminate that, then it's reducing the harm you're causing to others. So the harm isn't coming to you. So if you look at the five precepts in detail, which I have them in volume one, <clears throat> excuse me, volume one, chapter seven, you can see the words of the Buddha there, and then you can see how I've applied it to modern day situations to help you see this gray area. Oftentimes when people look at the five precepts, they want to think of them as black and white, but that's not the case. There's this large gray area that people oftentimes have trouble seeing. So if you can learn the five precepts and then see how to apply it in daily life, then it is much more straightforward to you and you don't see this large gray area anymore. You can see with clarity what is 
truly transpiring in terms of this natural law of gamma. And then with you being more informed and more wise about the natural law of gamma, you can make wiser decisions that lead to wholesome outcomes. And then the Buddha is describing this as great gifts that you can give to other people by you choosing to not cause harm. Because by you choosing to not cause harm, it helps you, it helps those close to you who would potentially be harmed by your decision making. And it helps all of humanity because there's less and less harm in the world for people to deal with. So let me see what questions you guys might have on this particular chapter. It's titled A Great Gift, Chapter 31. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. So let's move on to the next chapter, which is chapter 32. And just to remind you guys in Zoom, if you guys would like to read it all, you're welcome to read. Oh, there's Marcy volunteering right there. Sure, Marcy, you can go ahead and read. Thank you, Teacher David. One is reborn through one's deeds. Monks, beings are the owners of their karma, the heirs of their karma. They have karma as their origin, karma as their relative, karma as their resort. Whatever karma they do, wholesome or unwholesome, they are its heirs. Here, having abandoned the destruction of life, someone abstains from the destruction of life. With the rod and weapon laid aside, dedicated and kind, kindly, he resides compassionate towards all living beings. He does not creep along, he does not creep along by body, speech, and mind. His bodily comma is straight. His verbal comma is straight. His mental comma is straight. His destination is straight. His, his rebirth is straight. But for, one with a, but for one with a straight destination and rebirth, I say, there is one of two destinations, either the exclusively pleasant heavens or influential families such as those of affluent, I cannot pronounce that, Kayatis? Katias. Katias, mm -hmm. fluent mm -hmm. Brahmins or affluent householders, families that are rich with great wealth and property, abundant gold and silver, abundant treasures and belongings, abundant wealth and grain. Thus, a being is reborn from a being. One is reborn through one's deeds. When one has been reborn, contacts affect one. Contacts affect one. In this way, I say that beings are the heirs of their karma. The Tagatha spoke of abandoning of taking what is not given and abandoning of sexual misconduct with discourses similar to that of abandoning taking life. He also spoke of the fourfold wholesome conduct of speech and the threefold wholesome conduct of mind in the same way. Okay, thank you, Marcy. <clears throat> so here, let's break this one down. There's a lot that he's saying in this short little discourse here. The first thing that he's talking about here, where he says, monks, beings are the owners of their gamma, the heirs of their gamma. They have gamma as their origin, gamma as their relative, gamma as their resort. Whatever gamma they do, wholesome or unwholesome, they are its heirs. What he's saying here is that you're the only one that can produce gamma for yourself. This word karma in the Sanskrit language or gamma in the Pali language, it's all it's referring to the same thing, which is this natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result. And the Buddha is bringing clarity to this natural law to help people see the truth that nobody else can make decisions for you that are going to then produce results in your life. It's only your decisions that are going to produce certain results in your life. So when you understand that with clarity, that you're not subjected to good luck and bad luck, you don't have fate or you don't have, you know, this destiny that you're destined to experience certain things in life. And there's not this good and bad luck that I'm talking about. When you realize that everything you experience in your life is a collection of the results of your decisions, 
then this is very empowering because if there's anything that you find that you don't particularly like about what's going on in your life, you can just make different decisions that produce different results. So if you don't like a certain job that you have, if you feel miserable at this job, you can make decisions to overcome that and move beyond it. If you feel like you don't make enough income, you can make decisions to build up improved amount of income. If you don't like where you live, you can make decisions to change where you live. If you don't like certain things about your clothing or the people that you spend time with or your life partner, the person who you're uh, with on a regular basis, you can make decisions that change these things. You're not subjected to good luck and bad luck or fate or destiny or anything like this. Everything you experience is the result of your decisions. And the more clarity that you can see that with, then it's just a matter of cultivating wisdom of the natural law of gamma so that you can make wise decisions that lead to wholesome results. As long as you're lacking wisdom of this natural law of gamma, you will make unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. So by you cultivating wisdom, you'll then be able to produce only wholesome results in your life by making wise decisions. Some of those wise decisions are around our bodily, verbal, and mental conduct. Here, the Buddha is describing once again this first precept where he's talking about abandoning the destruction of life. Someone abstains from the destruction of life without rod and weapon laid aside or with the rod and weapon laid aside, dedicated and kindly. He resides compassionate towards all living beings. So this is more of the actual precept of what the Buddha taught as the first precept. Oftentimes people translate, or they're not even translating, they're just kind of summarizing. They say that the Buddha taught no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no intoxicants. Well, this sounds very black and white, and it sounds like a bunch of rules. And if that's what you've heard that the Buddha taught around the five precepts, he actually didn't teach it that way. He taught it with much more illuminating language that gives you much more clarity in why you're practicing a certain precept, and he helps you to be able to navigate that area that is gray that maybe is not clear to you so if you look at volume one chapter seven where i describe the five precepts in detail using the words of the buddha and then applying it in daily life you can see with more clarity what the buddha actually taught because by you choosing to not do something like killing the buddha is saying that you do not creep along by body speech and mind <clears throat> what he means here is by creeping along, it means you're trying to hide the things that you're doing, that you're, uh, you know, just kind of uh, doing things on the slick and sly. Maybe when you're in the public, you have one public facing face, but then on the in the background behind everyone's back, you're doing something slick and sly. This is when one does not creep along by body, speech and mind. They're not hiding things. And there's another teaching that he shares where he talks about if one uh, does creep along where they're hiding things, then ultimately they're going to be reborn into the animal realm, into animals that creep along, something like a gecko that runs and hides whenever the light turns on, or like a cockroach or something like that, that when you turn on the light, it runs and hides. The Buddha calls this like animals that creep along, that if you creep along in the human realm, then you're going to be reborn into an animal existence where you creep along. And he doesn't use this in order to guilt, shame, or fear you into learning and practicing his teachings. <clears throat> Again, because one of his main goals is to eliminate guilt, shame, and fear among all the other discontent feelings. So he's just sharing with you true reality of what's truly going to occur. And he talks about when you abstain from killing, that your bodily comma is straight, your verbal comma is straight, and your mental comma is straight. When he says straight, what he means is upright, the wholesome way. And that because of this straight gamma or this wholesome gamma that you're producing, then if you are reborn, then your destination is straight or improving or leading to an improved rebirth. And this improved rebirth, <clears throat> as he's describing here, is either in the heavenly realm or being reborn among affluent families. Well, like I mentioned in the past chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat is, needs to be cleared out. Um, as I mentioned in the past chapter, the goal of this path isn't to be reborn in the heavenly realm. It isn't to be reborn anywhere at all, but to get to enlightenment in this life. 
In fact, being reborn in the heavenly realm is not ideal because these beings experience exclusively pleasant feelings. That means they're not experiencing things like the painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. Heavenly beings don't experience that. So they can get to enlightenment in that heavenly realm, but they oftentimes lack the motivation and encouragement to do so because they don't have that built-in motivation of the painful feelings. They're only experiencing happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, and euphoria. So because they lack uh, enthusiasm and motivation and they're oftentimes complacent they are oftentimes reborn into other realms in order to you know live out their gamma so they're still in existence and that heavenly realm is not a permanent realm so what you would like to do is get to enlightenment in this life because in the human life this is the ideal existence because yes you experience pleasant feelings but you also experience those painful feelings and neither painful nor pleasant which is kind of like built-in motivation and everything that it takes to get to enlightenment in this life are the same things that are going to lead to an improved rebirth if you fall short of enlightenment for any reason. So if you are falling short of enlightenment and you're born into the heavenly realm, okay, that's where you're reborn. You still need to get to enlightenment there. But you could also be reborn into what the Buddha is describing as influential families. What this is, is individuals or families that are well off, that have this uh, great wealth and property, abundant uh, resources, essentially. Because if you're reborn into a family like that, it's actually easier for you to get to enlightenment if you choose to move in that direction. It doesn't mean that if you're born into a family that lacks resources, you can't get to enlightenment. It just means that you have more obstacles to overcome. Because if you're born into a family that lacks resources, you might be super busy trying to provide food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care. And that's going to take up a certain amount of your time and effort effort and energy. So therefore, you're not going to have as much time to focus on learning the teachings of the Buddha and training your mind. But if you're born into a wealthier family, then all those basic necessities are already taken care of. And if you choose to walk towards enlightenment, now you don't need to worry about your basic necessity. Those are already taken care of. You can just spend your time focused on training your mind. So in this way, being reborn into an affluent or rich family would be beneficial to an individual. So that's why the Buddha is saying that by you practicing what's referred to as the 10 wholesome moral conduct or other ways of referring to this, which the Buddha talked about earlier in this book, there's a chapter there that he talks about eliminating the killing, the stealing, the sexual misconduct. And then he also talks about the speech, that abandoning certain speech and having this wholesome speech and then the threefold wholesome mental conduct as well. There's a previous chapter in the same book where he goes through these 10 wholesome deeds or 10 wholesome actions. And he describes this as producing wholesome gamma. So you can see that earlier in the book because that's what it's going to take for you to get to enlightenment is order to practice those as well as many other teachings on the path to enlightenment. And then again, if you fall short, then your rebirth is going to be uh, an improved rebirth. Here the Buddha is saying, thus a being is reborn from a being, meaning one being is reborn to another being. You're a completely new being when you move from one being to the next. There's not truly rebirth of anything at all. It's a new body and a new mind. So it's really the cycle of new existence. Even though we call it rebirth, there's nothing that's really being reborn. It's craving and residual memories that's going from one life to the next. So that's why he's saying, thus a being is reborn from a being. So depending on what one being does, does, if they get to enlightenment and extinguish the three fires of craving, anger, and ignorance, then there's not rebirth. But if those fires are still there in the mind, then there's going to be rebirth because it's like a spark coming off of a fire. The wind carries it and now it lights and ignites a new fire. One is reborn through one's deeds. So it's based on your decisions that is going to determine whether or not you're reborn or not. And the Buddha gives other clarity on this in other discourses, but here he's just referencing that. When one, is re when one has been reborn, contact affects one. 
What he's talking about here is contact through the six sense bases, that when you experience contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body and the mind itself, this is going to lead to discontentedness because when you're in existence, prior to getting to enlightenment, there's still craving, desire, attachment in the mind. You have certain things that are agreeable to you. And when you get contact that is agreeable, you'll get pleasant feelings. But when you get disagreeable contact, you will then get painful feelings like sadness, anger, and others. So he's saying when you're reborn, you're coming back into the world as an unenlightened being, you have craving, desire, attachment. And now this contact through the six sense bases is going to affect you. And then he says, in this way, I say that beings are the heirs of their gamma, because whatever decisions you make in this life is going to determine whether you get to enlightenment and escape the cycle of rebirth or whether you continue on. And remember, the goal is to get to that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy in this life. And you can see the mind doing this as you train more and more in the teachings. You can see the mind moving to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. That's the very unique thing about the Buddhist teachings. Oftentimes, people are taught in various traditions to believe, 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 and hope something good happens when you die. That's not the way that the teachings of the Buddha work. You're learning his teachings now. You're reflecting on them to independently verify them now in this life. And you're practicing those teachings now in this life to train your mind. And as you do, you see the results now. So you know that your mind's moving to this peaceful and joyful mental state because you know what once used to produce anger or other discontent feelings in your mind. You know those situations that that those discontent feelings arose and now as you're training your mind and you see your mind is peaceful and joyful in all these situations then you know that your condition of your mind is improving so that's why he says in this way i say that beings are the heirs of their gamma you're experiencing whatever results come from the decisions you make and the buddha is giving you the wisdom of how to make wise decisions that doesn't cause harm to others that you practice harmlessness because when you practice harmlessness then it's going to produce wholesome gamma when you practice harmfulness then it's going to produce unwholesome gamma and you're going to experience that either wholesome or unwholesome you're going to experience the results of your decisions so let me see what questions you guys have on this chapter you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Marcy, looks like you have a question. Go ahead. Hi about that, Teacher David. Um, so when the Buddha speaks here and he says, um, you will exclusively pleasant heavens, or influential families, such as those of influential, the word I cannot say, of Bahamas and all that stuff. Um, when he speaks of this, we have people in this world now that are in these types of families. So would it be okay for me to say that these people in a past life generated enough good karma to be born of this? And then now when they're in this existence, it's their decisions that contribute to their new karma and their discontentedness. Yes. Does that make sense? That's 100% true. And that's one of the reasons why the Buddha is explaining this, because oftentimes people are sitting around like, you know, why did he get to be born or why did she get to be born into a great family? And I'm over here and this, you know, disgruntled family. Well, it's based on your karma from your previous life. And then once you're reborn into a certain family, from there, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be done for you. Even being reborn into a rich, affluent family, you still need to do work, right? Like you're, you're, you're not enlightened yet. You're in a better existence than you were in a previous life, but you're still needing to do the work. And beings either walk towards the darkness or walk towards the light. So even when someone's born into a affluent rich family they can still walk towards the darkness or they could walk towards the light the choice is always each individual's 
person's decision, and then they'll experience the results therein. So if somebody is in a rich family and they're walking towards the darkness, yeah, they're going to be more and more discontent and have more and more difficulties in life. But somebody can also walk towards the light as well. And the same thing when someone's born into a family that lacks resources. They can walk towards the darkness and things can get worse for them. Or they can walk towards the light and things can get gradually improved for them from that particular life. So anybody, in fact, I think one of the chapters we're going to be reading today, you're going to see where the Buddha says anybody born in any type of family can get to enlightenment in this life. But being in a rich, affluent family, if you walk towards the light, it makes it a bit more easy for you because you don't have to take care of your basic necessities. Yeah, so that basically makes, you know, clarifies it for me because, you know, when you think about it, you think somebody that's rich or whatever, and they there are people out there that have, you know, all kinds of money, but their craving is still very high. They're still mm -hmm. wanting and wanting things. Um, and so my my other question would be that, so somebody that, that gets, has the good karma, comes into a, you know, a, the, a, a, a a more um, beneficial family life, right? At that point, if they do walk towards the darkness, could they then perpetually be reborn into like a lower realm at that point in time? So that's like that real cycle of getting stuck in that loop, right? Exactly. The karma comes up, you get reborn good, you have all these things, you walk still towards the darkness, then boom, you're back down to the lower realms. And then that that's that circle that keeps just going. Am, am I seeing that correctly? You're seeing that 100% correctly. Beings are moving in and out of these different realms all the time. And there's nothing that says you're going to sequentially move up and then get to enlightenment. You can move from the heavenly realm all the way down to the hell realm. And you can move from the hell realm up to the heavenly realm. It's very rare for that to occur, but it is possible. Beings are moving in and out of these realms all the time. So it really comes down to the results of your decisions. And that's why the more wise you become, you can see the condition of your mind improving through training in these teachings. And the goal is to improve the condition of the mind in this very life. Because right now, anybody who's listening to this, you're close to the teachings of the Buddha. You're now having access to them. There's millions and millions and billions of beings out there that don't even have access to the teachings of the Buddha or even realize that they even exist or realize that you can even escape something like sadness or anger, or frustration and other feelings. Oftentimes people just think they're subjected to that. So if you're listening to this and you're having access to these teachings, that means you're really in a good position to now be able to investigate these teachings and practice them to the point where you can make real progress in this life and potentially attain enlightenment as well. Thank you, Teacher David. I appreciate it. Yes, you're welcome. I see we have a question here on YouTube. The question is, why do some people have to take care of pets? So everybody is a little bit different. Some people have a certain amount of loving kindness and compassion, and they would like to take care of animals in order to have them uh, be taken care of. Other people, they might be doing it out of craving, desire, attachment. It really, you can't look at one particular thing and see, okay, this person's taking care of pets, so that means they have craving, desire, attachment. It's not a one for one like that. It's all about what's going on in one's own mind. So there's pets now that are living in environments side by side with human beings this is one of the reasons why we're seeing the explosion of the human realm the way that we are more and more population because these animals in the animal realm are becoming more and more domesticated they're becoming more loving and kind and compassionate and friendly and loving because they're living side by side with humans and now as they're dying there's a lot more rebirth into the human realm we've shrunk down the animal realm significantly Scientists say that out of all the animals that once existed, only 1% still exist in the world. The other 99% are now extinct. And that's why we see this proliferation and explosion of the human realm, where more and more beings are coming into the human realm. So people take care of pets for different reasons, right? It really comes down to their individual decisions. 
And the goal would be for you to make a decision in your life about what you're interested in doing. And I'm not saying that you're doing this, but sometimes what people might try to do is judge other people for what other people are choosing to do. And you should never put yourself in that situation because that's one's own conceit that's coming up in the mind. And when we're judging people, putting ourselves above or below others, this is harming your own mind. It's not harming other people. So if other people choose to take care of pets, that's fine. That's wonderful. That's their choice. It doesn't affect you. It's all about your decisions in this life. That's going to lead to your uh, improvement. And then, you know, I'll just add this personal note that growing up throughout life, you know, our family always had animals around. We grew up with lots of different pets. And even in my adult life, there was a couple of times where I had a pet. But at this point in my life, I wouldn't have an animal uh, for various reasons. But that doesn't mean someone who does have an animal is doing anything wrong or bad or anything like that. That's their personal choice. And it's always wise to never judge anyone else for their decisions because, an animal can potentially help somebody learn how to be more loving and kind and compassionate. It can be helpful for them, perhaps. Uh, there's other things that it could potentially be helpful for. But at this point in my life and where I am in my life and what I've learned and what I've done and what I've observed in the world, I wouldn't have an animal as a pet. But that's just for me. And everybody has to make their own personal choice. And then they experience the results of those personal choices. Let me see if we have any more questions anywhere else on our other platforms. It looks like we have a question here on Facebook from Chrissy. Teacher David, when one practices the teachings and experiences this peace you speak of and then falls away from their practice, is it then starting over from the beginning or can the practice be regained sooner than the first time? Yes, it's the latter, Chrissy, that if someone practices for a period of time and then they fall away from their practice, it's actually... Um, the, the knowledge and wisdom is still there. There's some accumulated benefits that have been there. It's just a matter of picking it back up and rededicating yourself and getting more determined and diligent again. You're not starting all the way over from the beginning. Now, there will be some backsliding, right? Like wherever you finished, if somebody practiced up to a certain point and they were experiencing certain benefits, there will be some backsliding. But when they pick things back up, their progress going forward will be more straightforward and more readily experienced than it was when they very, very, very first started. When someone first starts on the path, it's really quite challenging to get your arms around all the various teachings and all the various practices and building up your meditation practice and creating space in your life for all these things. So it's really a challenge. And since we're talking about rebirth, it also depends on where you're being reborn from. A lot of us are being reborn out of the animal realm, which means if you had immediate animal existence before this and you're coming right into the human realm, and this is maybe one's first rebirth into the human realm, it's going to be a lot more challenging for that being because their mind has experienced so many uh, animal existences so recently that their mind hasn't really had much opportunity to be cultivated. Or if someone's coming out of the hell realm or someone's coming out of the afflicted spirits realm, if someone's coming out of the heavenly realm into the human realm, they're going to have a lot uh, improved condition of mind versus someone who's coming out of the animal realm into the human realm. So every being who gets on the path to enlightenment, they're starting at different places in terms of the amount of pollution that's in their mind. And then as you get on the path to enlightenment, depending on the amount of pollution in your mind, it's a challenge oftentimes to get your arms around a certain amount of practice and teachings. And then depending on what's going on in your life, you know, I know a bit about a number of your guys' life, you know, if you've had children, if you currently have children, if you're a single mom or single dad, if you work a really hard and difficult and hectic job, if you lack resources, all of these things are obstacles that one needs to overcome. And it's quite challenging to do that. So as you uh, gradually work towards the goal, you can just incrementally and slowly work towards improvement where you can then get on the path, gradually get your arms around this and gradually progress. But backsliding is kind of part of it all. Like I know that as I got onto this path, there was plenty of times where I backslided, right? So this is part of the path. This is part of the wisdom that you're cultivating along the journey that as you practice and you maybe practice for a while and you backslide a little bit and you see 
how the mind is functioning during that backsliding. You're like, oh my goodness, my mind was in such a better condition before. You can observe like, wow, these teachings were really working before. So that's part of the wisdom that you're cultivating that during those backsliding moments or weeks or months or however long someone backslides for, it's helping you to cultivate wisdom in those situations. And it almost helps you to rededicate yourself because you're not interested in going back to the darkness, so to speak. So great question, Christy. All right, it looks like uh, Dwight, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, hi, um, Dwight, I, um, there's a gopher destroying my, my yard in the back, my backyard. And um, I, if I feel like if I continue to let it do that, it's gonna destroy the whole yard. And I'm, my wife wants me to kill it and I am conflicted about it. And um, I, uh, Feel like I, I might just want to just uh, do it and then accept the consequences, whatever they may be, and then those consequences will pass away because everything is impermanent. Um, is 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 uh, my 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 question is, uh, I I don't think the consequences will be that much. It's not like I'm hurting a human, and uh, so I don't see how the gopher world is going to cause me harm, but I'm just so con conflicted about it and I, I want to follow my dharma. And I'm wondering if this would be too much of a detour. I know that there's possibilities to relocate gophers, but I've heard that that's just as harmful as killing them. So I'm not in a dilemma what to do. Sure, Dwight, great question. If it was me and it was my yard, I would try to do like a live trap and then relocate it to another area. And this is that being skama, right? This is one of the challenges of being in the animal realm is they lack the ability to cultivate their consciousness to the point of enough wisdom to get to enlightenment. So oftentimes animals are causing harm, something like termites, for example, they're causing harm. So in a situation like this, where they're just destroying the yard and you would like to have the yard look a certain way, this is just aesthetics. They're not really destroying your dwelling. They're just destroying something that you would rather and prefer to look a better way. So if you're able to live trap it and relocate it somewhere else, well, when it relocates, if it uh, then experiences any harm as a result of that, then that is its gamma based on being in the animal realm, because it's going to need to be reborn into the human realm eventually anyway, in order to get to enlightenment. But if you kill that being, then you're going to experience the harm. And I suggest that the harm that you're going to experience in that situation is you're probably going to experience some guilt. You're going to maybe experience some fear and some other feelings like this. You might experience some kind of injuries as well to your own body. So it's best if you can just relocate it, then you won't have to experience that. You're 100% accurate that the gamma associated with killing an animal is much less than killing a human but there's still some gamma associated with it. And then one other thing I will add to this is the Buddha, when he talks about killing, he talks about repeated killing, that this is very harmful for one. So if you haven't really done any killing in your life and you did end up choosing to kill this gopher, if it was just this one time, then the gamma is gonna be much less than if you repeatedly killed. But it's going to take you more time, which means it's going to take you more loving kindness and compassion to live trap it and then relocate it. So uh, that's why that's what you're ultimately trying to cultivate. That's what that precept is there for. It's there so that you don't produce harmful decisions that is going to then cause harm to you. But what that first precept is really for is it's for you to eliminate ill will, which is one of the fetters or one of the pollutions in the mind that hinder you from getting to enlightenment. So by you choosing to cultivate loving kindness and compassion, even if it takes you more time to live trap it and relocate it, then it's helping you to eliminate that ill will and function in a way that is allowing you to then get rid of that pollution and that ill will in the mind which brings you closer to enlightenment. So what you choose to do, whether you kill it or live trap it, it's up to you. But I would encourage you to consider taking your time and live trapping it if you can. All right, so we got a bunch more questions here. Um, I see that um, Marcy has her hand up and Dwight, you still have your hand up. I don't know if you have a follow-up question or uh, or not. I'm going to... I'm trying to, I'm trying to un, un, uh, raise my hand lower. There we go. Sure, no worries. 
I just thought I'd check with you. I did something different this class than I've done in previous classes. I made it so that uh, I have to click a button for you to unmute. So I just thought I'd check with you. All right, so we'll go to Marcy if you'd like to ask your question. Then I see Vladimir has one on YouTube as well. So, Teacher David, I got a quick question for you. Um, speaking of this, you know, abandoning and killing, uh, I'm going to make this as quick as I can. I have a hummingbird feeder at one of my clients' houses, and the hummingbird feeder uh, tends to get um, ants all over it, right? So I take the hummingbird feeder, I tap it, I bang it, try to get off as many um, ants as I possibly can. But, you know, I find that there, I don't have as much time to sit there and make sure every ant gets off of it. So then I just take it to the sink and I rinse it off and the ants go down the drain. Now, I'm not intentionally trying to cause harm to these ants, but I also, I'm trying to get, you know, free as many as I can, but there's still some that are on that that I'm rinsing down the drain. Now, would it be more beneficial for me to take the time and try to make sure that every little ant gets off of that? or doing as I've been doing, just kind of you know banging off what I can and then rinsing the rest down the drain. It comes down to your intention, right? That's what the Buddha describes in terms of gama, is you would like to have the intention of harmlessness. So if you are doing the very best you can do with the amount of time that you have to get as many ants off as possible, and then you're choosing to wash this hummingbird feeder in order to clean it out and get it ready for its next refill, then you've put the intention of harmlessness into this activity and you're practicing loving kindness and compassion while you're doing it. Because there are certain parameters here, right? Like you can't stay there for three hours getting every last little ant off. So you gotta find that middle way where you've practiced the intention of harmlessness, but then you're also attending to the other tasks that you have in daily life as well. Thank you, Teacher David. I appreciate the clarification. You're welcome. All right, so Vladimir is asking a question here on YouTube. He says, if someone was born in a poor family that became wealthy, will it be the effect of nowadays actionable or as well, it is partly the effect of past lives? For example, if family was poor and had problems, but after 10 years opened successful business and became wealthy. So that is the, the starting off with lack of resources. That's gamma from the previous life because we're starting off in life with a lack of resources. Any new decisions that we're making in this life where we become wealthy, this is our new gamma in this life based on the decisions we're making in this life. That's how you can understand what the example that you're providing there. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions here. So let's go ahead and move on to the next chapter. And I see Marcy volunteered to read all of these for us. So if there's anyone else in Zoom that would like to read, you're welcome to. Just raise your hand and you'll be able to read these chapters. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and let Marcy read some. And Marcy, if you need help, uh, just let me know and I can step in and read some as well. Marcy, your mute's still on. I'm not sure if you're reading or not. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm here. <laughs> your your connection's breaking up. I'm not getting any audio out of you. Hey, I David. Can... Are you there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me now. I can. Yep, sounds like we're we're not hearing you now. Okay, I'll go ahead and read this one, Marcy, and then maybe you can try the next one. It sounds like it's cutting in and out on us. So this is chapter 33. It's titled, One is Reborn Through One's Creeping Deeds. Monks, I will teach you a discourse of the teachings on creeping. Listen and attend closely. And what, monks, is that discourse of the teachings on creeping? Monks, beings are the owners of their gamma the heirs of their gamma. They have gamma as their origin, gamma as their relative, gamma as their resort. Whatever gamma they do, wholesome or unwholesome, they are its heirs. Here, someone destroys life. He is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. He creeps along by body, speech, and mind. 
His bodily gamma is crooked. His verbal gamma is crooked. His mental gamma is crooked. His destination is crooked. His rebirth is crooked. But for one with a crooked destination and rebirth, I say, there is one of two destinations, either the exclusively painful hells or a species of creeping animal. And what are the species of creeping animals? The snake, the scorpion, the centipede, the mongoose, the cat, the mouse, and the owl, or any other animals that creep away when one sees people. Thus, a being is reborn from a being. One is reborn through one's deeds. When one has been reborn, contact affects one. It is in this way, I say, that beings are the heirs of their karma. The Tathagata spoke of taking what is not given and engages in sexual misconduct with discourses similar to that of taking life. He also spoke of the fourfold misconduct of speech and the threefold misconduct of mind in the same way. So this is exactly the opposite of the one that we were just talking about. And I'm referring, and this is the one I was referring to when I said that the Buddha talks about when you're creeping along with your gamma, when you're trying to kind of hide maybe what you're choosing to do and you're, you're kind of, uh, you know, not attending to making wise decisions in your life. And you might decide to look at the previous chapters where he talks about the 10 wholesome deeds and the 10 unwholesome deeds, because that's what he's referencing here. So I'll just see if you guys have any questions on this one because it's exactly opposite of what we just described and what we just talked about. Okay. Looks like Marcy, you have your hand up. Go ahead. So this is where the part where you were speaking about if someone creeps along this is where they'll be reborn as a creeping type of um, animal, like a snake or a lizard or something of that sort, correct? Exactly. Okay. All right, let me see if we have any other comments here, any other questions. All right, I'm not seeing anything here. So let's go ahead and move on to the next chapter. And Marcy, sounds like your connection is better. If you'd like to pick up on the next chapter, it's chapter 34. Absolutely. At a minimum leads to deeds. Monks, the destruction of life repeatedly pursued, developed and cultivated leads to hell, to the animal realm and to the realm of the afflicted spirit. For one reborn as a human being, the destruction of life at minimum leads to a short lifespan. Taking what is not given, repeatedly pursued, developed, and cultivated leads, leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, taking what is not given at minimum leads to loss of wealth. Sexual misconduct, repeatedly pursued, developed, and cultivated leads to hell to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as human beings, sexual misconduct at minimum leads to hostility and competition. False speech, repeatedly pursued, developed, and cultivated leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, false speech as a minimum leads to false ac accusations. Argumentative speech, repetitively pursued, developed, and cultivated, leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, argumentative speech at a minimum leads to beings separated from one's friends. Harsh speech, repetitively pursued, developed, and cultivated, leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, harsh speech at a minimum leads to disagreeable sounds. Idle chatter, repetitively pursued, developed, and cultivated, leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, idle ch chatter at a minimum leads to others distrusting one's words. Drinking liquor and wine, ingestions of substances that cause heedlessness, repetitively pursued, developed, and cultivated, leads to hell, to the animal realm, to the realm of afflicted spirits. For one reborn as a human being, drinking liquor and wine, ingesting of substances that cause heedlessness, at minimum, leads to madness. Okay, thanks, Marcy. 
So here the Buddha is giving you some detailed guidance of a certain action that leads to a specific result. This is very rare in the teachings of the Buddha to see this level of detail because there's another chapter that he taught, another discourse prior to this in this book where he talks about the exact result of gamma and trying to discern what is the exact result of gamma is going to lead to either madness or frustration because you can't take any particular series of actions and tell you exactly, 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 exactly how it's going to be experienced from that particular being. But here he's giving you some general understanding of what one particular action is going to then lead to when you're repeatedly doing that over and over. This is what I was referring to Dwight when we were just talking about the destruction of life, repeatedly pursued, developed and cultivated. So here he's saying that yes, it leads to rebirth in those lower realms, the hell realm, animal realm, and realm of afflicted spirits. In those lower realms, you can't get to enlightenment. You're going to need to be constantly reborn over and over and over and over again to ever get back to a human or heavenly existence to be able to have the opportunity to get to enlightenment. So we've all been in these lower realms at one point in time or another, and now we've gotten to the human realm, and this is the ideal time for us to get to enlightenment. It would be very unwise for us to continue to make decisions that would lead to rebirth back into these lower realms, but instead we can get to enlightenment in this life but even in doing these things somebody could be murderous or destruction of life and be reborn back into the human realm it's possible and the buddha is explaining here that one who's done that that at minimum it leads to a shorter lifespan and what i suggest you do just like with all the teachings of the buddha is that you don't believe his teachings you learn you reflect to independently verify and then you practice and here with each one of these by him helping you to see what it leads to, you can actually reflect on these and see the truth for yourself. Like this first one, the destruction of life. You know that if somebody destroys life, that they're going to have a shorter lifespan. So look at anybody who's a murderer. Look at anybody who's gone off to war and who's killed. Remember, we're not talking about the human laws here because the natural law of Gam is a much higher law than societal laws. So your government can tell you, okay, if you kill somebody in our country, we're going to prosecute you for murder. But if you go to that country over there and kill those people, we're not going to prosecute you for murder. Well, that's a human law, right? That's not the natural law of Gam. And that's why when soldiers go off to war, they're very likely to be killed. They're very likely to get injured. They're very likely to have traumatic mental uh, challenges. They can even commit suicide and they can have all kinds of difficulties. A lot of people who went away to war and were killing, they now might be homeless or addicted to drugs or having committed suicide. This is the gamma as a result of their decisions. They're government, the human law said, yeah, you can go kill over there, but you can't escape the natural law of gamma. It's impossible. So you can see the truth in this one for yourself. And you can take each individual one of these, like this next one is taking what is not given, stealing, at minimum leads to a loss of wealth. So if you have either stole before or you've seen people around you that have stolen, look and see. You'll see that you have lost wealth, right? And then the same thing with each individual one of these. You can independently confirm these for yourself. And that's how you then cultivate wisdom to be able to see this natural law of gamma so clearly that you understand that the Buddha is not teaching you rules or commandments. He's showing you the truth. And then he leaves it up to you to reflect on that, to independently verify it. And then once you've learned and you've independently reflected to verify it, then you start practicing. You start eliminating killing and stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, argumentative speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, and taking substances that cause heedlessness. And when you eliminate these from your practice, you'll see the beneficial results that are occurring in your life of having done so. Because if you walk around and continue to speak harshly to people, then people are going to start speaking harshly with you. That's this disagreeable sounds that are going to come to you. So by you eliminating the harsh speech to people, then you'll notice that people won't speak harsh and aggressive with you and other disagreeable sounds as well. So you can go through each one of these and verify it. And then with that wisdom, you'll see like, oh my goodness, I need to clean this up. I need to stop speaking so harshly. I need to be gentle and kind and loving. Look at your word choice, your tone and your tempo. If you improve your word 
word choice, your tone, and your tempo, you can get to a point where you're speaking gently with all the people around you. And it's going to take you eliminating craving, desire, attachment to be able to do that. That's why breathing mindfulness meditation and all these other teachings are in place. Because if you have craving, desire, attachment, it's very challenging to talk gentle to others. You might speak harsh in some situations to people, but this is going to cause harm to them. And now that harm is going to come back to you. So by you dedicating yourself to developing all aspects of this path, including right intention and right speech in this particular example, now by you practicing right intention and right speech, you can eliminate harsh speech by speaking gently. And now you'll see an improvement in your personal professional relationships. And you'll know this is the truth. This isn't rules. It's not commandments. It's not something that's going to happen in the future in trying to guilt or shame you. He's showing you right now in the present moment, if you improve your conduct, you'll have an improved experience. This is the cause and effect or action and result. So let me know what questions you guys have on this chapter. This is chapter 34, at minimum leads to deeds. Okay, Marcy, looks like you have a question. Go ahead. Yes. So teacher David, as I've been studying um, the Buddha's teachings, I noticed that like with each one of his things, he does repetition of the same words. Is is that a, his way of um, embedding the the the, the knowledge into you, like the repetitive, like of, you know, taking what is not a given, but every word after that, repetitively pursued, developed and cultivated leads to the animal, to the hell, to the animal realm. And then for each one, he does that. And I notice in a lot of other um, teachings that he does, he does the same thing, that repetitive words. Yes. So he taught as an oral tradition. They didn't write things down during his life. And there's three ways in an oral tradition to help people commit your teachings to memory. One is you tell stories because people are going to remember a story much either easier than just brute uh, content and facts. So that's why you get these similes where he's telling stories about poisonous arrows and lumps of salt and things like this. The other thing is, is that you give lists of four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, the ten fetters, the seven factors of enlightenment, the three poisons, right? You give lists because if you're short on the list, you're going to like, there's one more, there's one more. I know there's one more. What is it? Right. And you, and you have to remember it. So you give lists. And then the third thing you do to get people to remember an oral tradition is you make it repetitive that sometimes you can see his discourses and it's just the same thing. I have a book here. Um, here it is right here. I have this book here that is uh, volume 11 of the 45 volume book series. And you can read about 100 pages in this book. And it's the exact same thing over and over with like one word or one sentence changing. And uh, that's the way that he taught. And that's the reason why it is 45 books because of the repetition. And that's why we've been able to consolidate the teachings down into this 13 book book series because the repetition has been taken out of the same discourse being repeated over and over. And now you can see it in a more consolidated form, which is easier to digest. But if you're living during the lifetime of the Buddha, that repetition was so important to be able to commit it to memory and then actually be able to practice it. Because if you can't commit it to memory during the lifetime of the Buddha, you can't practice it. Where nowadays we can refer to a book every once in a while, refresh our memory, where they weren't able to do that during his lifetime. So that's why the repetition is there. Thank you, Teacher David. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Dwight, I saw you raised your hand. I didn't know if that was for reading because I see your comment there or whether you had a question. Well, I would just want to make sure, I, you know, I, I don't believe in rebirth and it seems like those things are just added to for incentives to follow these rules. I just believe that they will, um, you know, not having false speech and argumentative speech, so forth, so following the five precepts will lead to a calmer mind and happier, more contentment. Um, I, I'm just w wondering uh, if if, I, if 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 it's okay if I just don't believe in any of that stuff. I'm just I'm just trying to get a calm mind. Sure. Mind. Sure. You, this is your first time studying with me, as far as I know, Dwight. I haven't recalled seeing you before, but one of the things that I teach in the very beginning when students first start learning with me is to never believe anything. You shouldn't believe anything in regards to the teachings of the Buddha or anything else. All of his teachings can be learned. They can be 
reflect it on to independently verify and you can practice to be able to see the truth the fact is is that the cycle of rebirth is true it is real right now you're not seeing that and that's okay that i teach people to never believe in the cycle of rebirth but instead early in practice to just set it aside and focus on the the actual core teachings which leads to that improved condition of mind that you're talking about a peaceful mind and a joyful mind because that's the ultimate goal at some point in the future you might decide to approach the cycle of rebirth to be able to see it more clearly and there's teachings where you can independently verify that the cycle of rebirth is true but don't ever believe in it but you might decide that you would like to approach it to be able to see the truth for yourself because it is the truth that's why the buddha taught it so right now if you're focused on the core teachings in order to be able to get to that peaceful and joyful mind then do that but if you decide in the future to address and look at the cycle of rebirth, then there's the ability for you to do that, and I'll help you to accomplish that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We have some questions coming in here from Vladimir on YouTube. It says, will be not taking action, a bad action, or using force to stop will be unwholesome action. So what ideally should you do? will be ignoring how anybody hurts other living beings an unwholesome action. Basically, the question should be ignored or take actions in situations like these if the only way that you see is to hurt person to stop the crime or hurt key causes. Okay, so there's two things that I think you're asking here, Vladimir, and, and if I'm not fully understanding your question, feel free to ask follow-ups. The first part is it seems like you're asking if you ignore somebody being hurt or if you ignore a certain situation, are you producing unwholesome karma? And the answer is not necessarily because you're not required to take action in any given situation. It's all about the decisions that you make that determine what's being produced. So ignoring a particular thing doesn't mean that you're going to produce unwholesome karma. And I can give you an example of this. This past year, I was traveling in some other countries, and when I was at a shopping center, I heard an individual slap their child across their face. And it was really loud, it was very distinct. I had my back turned to the person at the time, and I had to ask the people I was with, did what happened that I think happened just really happen? And they're like, yeah, that's what actually happened. And I was like, all right, interesting. So I'm not under no obligation to go over there and talk to the dad or talk to the child and try to solve this situation because I can't solve the situation. I was in a foreign country, it was a different language, the person couldn't even talk to me. And even if it was an individual who could speak the same language as me, that child is still going home with that father, that father's not gonna snap his fingers and instantly realize that he's unwise to be slapping his child across the face like that. There's a certain amount of anger and hatred and ill will along with wrong intention and wrong speech I'm sorry, wrong intention and wrong action that's coming along with that. And there's probably some wrong view in there, of course, of sh I'm sure. So me going over there to talk to the person isn't gonna instantly solve the problem. And I'm under no obligation to go do that. I can't even talk to the person. It was a different language. I was in a completely foreign country that they don't really speak English very much. So it's not necessarily true that if you don't do something that you're going to experience unwholesome gamma because there are certain situations where you are not going to be able to do something and therefore what your gamma is based on is what you choose to do not what you choose not to do but let me give you another example that is uh, this, if you ignore something it does produce unwholesome gamma say if this was my son say if my son did some did something unwise we're living in the household together we're I'm going to obviously be in his life for a long-term period of time. I'm heavily interested in seeing this being become a wise individual because at some point in the future, he's probably going to be making decisions about my life. As I age, it's important for him to have as, as much wisdom as possible so that when he starts making decisions about my life as I age, that then he's making wise decisions. So if he's doing something that's unwise and I ignore it, now it's going to produce unwholesome karma for me because now he's going to be lacking the wisdom and then that wisdom isn't going to be there for him to then make decisions that would help me. So in some situations, if you ignore something, it's not going to produce unwholesome karma. 
in some situations, if you ignore something, it will produce unwholesome karma. So that's where you need to be able to see and understand the natural law of karma very clearly, that it's not black and white. There's this large gray area that you need to navigate and be able to see that very clearly. And then it looks like your next question is, the question should be ignored or take action in situations like if the only way that you see is to hurt a person, to stop a crime or hurt uh, this person that they're causing. So in this example, what it sounds like you're asking is like, say you're at home and somebody breaks into your house at 2 a.m. in the morning and your only option is to harm this individual in order to protect this being who you are and perhaps the other people in your home. Well, in this type of situation, what I encourage people to think about is that if you can get out of the house, just get out of the house and leave. Call the police. They're the ones who are equipped and trained to be able to handle that situation. But if you're backed up into a corner and your only option is to cause harm to this person in order to live compassionately for the welfare of this living being who you are, then you need to be able to do that. And I can't tell you right now all the different variables that you're going to face and what the outcome should be. This is where as a being that's moving to a higher consciousness and moving to this enlightened mental state, what you're doing is you're cultivating wisdom to understand the natural law of gamma. And then in the moment, by maintaining your calmness and composure, you can then use this wisdom to make a wise decision because you're gonna to need to take in all the variables that are gonna be unique in each individual decision. And then you're gonna to need to make a decision that's wise. And oftentimes, depending on what situation we're in, there's a lot of decisions that we made that led up to that, that we could have made differently, that we wouldn't find ourselves in that situation. So let me give you another example. Say that someone goes out to a bar at 10, 11, 12, midnight, and now they're drinking with people, they're partying it up, the bar closes, they're out on the street waiting for a taxi, and someone is intoxicated and comes and attacks you. Well, you've made a whole bunch of decisions that led up to that. You chose to go out really late at night. You chose to go to a bar, a place where people were getting intoxicated. You were intoxicated yourself. And now being there waiting for your taxi, okay, you getting attacked, that's your karma. That's the results of your decisions. You put yourself in that situation. It's not that you deserve it or it's a punishment for you doing that. But it's a sequencing of events. It's the results of your decisions. So oftentimes there's a lot of decisions that we can make that will uh, preclude us from experiencing these harmful situations that we can cultivate this wisdom of the path to enlightenment and choose to not go out at that time or choose to not go out to those type of establishments where people are going to be heedless and taking in intoxicants. So in each one of these types of situations, there's going to be a litany of variables and you're going to need to take those variables in and then do something with it and make a wise decision. And that's where you're moving to a higher consciousness and you're going to need to maintain your calmness and composure to be able to make those wise decisions. And that's why by eliminating craving, desire, attachment, through the teachings of the Buddha, you'll be able to maintain your calmness and composure and make wise decisions. Because when your mind's shaken up with fear or other discontent feelings, you're going to make unwise decisions because your mind is clouded because those discontent feelings have arisen. So by you eliminating craving, desire, attachment, bringing in some equanimity of calmness and composure, you'll now be able to make wise decisions in those situations that will produce wholesome outcomes. Looks like Marcy, you have a question. Go ahead. So, Teacher David, um, prior to getting on this on this path, um, I this being was a person that uh, went to the fire range all the time, and I have a firearm uh, that I used to shoot probably maybe two to three times a week. Um, since being on this path, I haven't found an interest in doing that, but I still have the firearm. It's in my, in my home. Now having that firearm, is it an intention with the, with the firearm that would bring unwholesome karma or is it something that would be more beneficial for me to be maybe just turn it in to get rid of it? This is a personal decision for each individual, whether they choose to have a firearm in their home or not, because each individual person's living situation and what they're experiencing in life is different from person to person. But just having a firearm sitting there, you're not causing any harm with that firearm. So there's no intention behind it. 
it's just like if you have a knife in your kitchen, uh, you're using it to cut up vegetables. Um, that's your intention with that knife. So whether somebody has a, a, a firearm in their house or not is a personal choice. They have to look at what they're experiencing in their life. But just having it sitting there isn't producing any unwholesome gamma. It's what you choose to do with it and how you choose to use it. If you pick it up and go out into the world and start aggressively killing people, of course, you know, that's producing unwholesome gamma. Or if somebody stole it and then took it, you might be accountable and responsible for that. One of the things that you should look at in relationship to owning a firearm is sometimes we own firearms, not always, but sometimes we own them out of fear, that there might be a fear of something occurring. And then that's why we might choose to purchase something like that. So you might decide to look at that and see if there's any of that involved. But just having one doesn't mean that you're necessarily producing wholesome gamma or unwholesome gamma. But then what happens with that firearm once you're the owner of it can determine whether you're going to experience wholesome or unwholesome gamma. And, and teacher David, it was, it was, I purchased the firearm and became licensed to carry due to a fear of being uh, attacked by um, my parents, you know, because of the, the history there. And that was a fear that I, that I lived with for a very long time, but I don't have that same fear anymore. So, um, I guess now it's just more of a personal decision on my part. Right. It's always a personal decision on your part. Even when you purchased it out of fear, it was still your personal decision. What you might look at is like, you know, if you don't have that fear anymore and you're making a lot of wise decisions and you feel very protected based on the decisions that you're making, you got to decide, is it more of a risk to have it here because it could be used against me or somebody could steal it and go do something with it and then I'm going to be held responsible for it? Is that more of a risk or is it more of a risk that some harm is going to come to me and I need to keep it here in case that harm comes to me, then I can defend myself. So you've got to weigh those options and decide for yourself, you know, what's more risky? What is the potential of producing an awesome gamma in this situation? Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. Chrissy has a question here on Facebook. She says, I see there is a struggle with harsh and argumentative speech. Is that saying that will lead to life in hell? So what the Buddha is explaining here about uh, harsh and argumentative speech is that if you uh, use it repeatedly, it's pursued, it's developed, it's cultivated. Yes, it leads to rebirth in the lower realms, but that's based on the condition of your mind at the time of death. You're not being judged for the totality of things that you do in your life, and then you're either going to a good place or a bad place. That's not what the Buddha taught at all. That's not the true reality of what's truly occurring. What determines your rebirth, if you're going to be reborn, is uh, based on the condition of the mind at the time of death. So right now, if you have a challenge with argumentative speech or harsh speech, okay, that's where you're at. And now that you understand that it leads, that argumentative speech leads to being separated from one's friends, you can see that to be the truth because if you've ever been argumentative in your speech, you see that friends leave you. And you can see that with harsh speech, yes, that leads to disagreeable sounds. You can see the truth in that. And then you also know that it leads to rebirth in the lower realms as well. So now what you do is you just dedicate yourself to learning and practicing and training your mind to purge this because you realize there are certain results that come with argumentative speech and harsh speech. So you don't have to be worried about your rebirth. When I was talking to Dwight, and I've shared this with other students, about setting the cycle of rebirth to the side, that's what I truly suggest for people. Because what's happened in the past, it's in the past, it doesn't matter anymore. What may or may not happen in the future, it's in the future that you know, you're not there yet. Right now, you're in the present moment. And if you know that you're having challenges with harsh speech and argumentative speech, then you would like to improve your practice now in the present moment to improve the condition of your mind to get to the point where you can get to enlightenment in this life. And then you'll see that your life is improving in this life. And then you may not ever get to rebirth. So by setting the cycle of rebirth to the side, don't be worried, don't be feared, don't feel any of that related to rebirth, but just focus on purging your argumentative speech and harsh speech. And then as you get closer and closer to enlightenment and you see that the mind's more peaceful and joyful, then if you get to enlightenment this life, great. And if you don't, then great. Then you've improved the condition of your mind. You're going to experience an improved rebirth and you don't need to worry about this 
rebirth into the lower realms because you're not choosing to repeatedly pursue argumentative speech and harsh speech, but instead you're working to dismantle it and eliminate it. You guys are having some great questions today. This is outstanding. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. And Dwight, you had offered to read. If you would like to read this next chapter, you're welcome to read this. Okay. <clears throat> chapter 35. In indebtedness is discontentedness in the world. Discontentedness in the world. Poverty is called discontentedness in the world. So too is getting into debt. A poor person who becomes indebted is troubled by while enjoying himself. Then they persecute, prosecute him, and he will he also incurs imprisonment. This imprisonment is indeed discontentedness for one yearning for gain and sexual pleasures. Just so in the noble one's discipline, one in whom confidence is lacking, who sees no danger in wrongdoing and rash, keeps up a mass of evil, unwholesome comma. Having engaged in misconduct by body, speech, and the mind, he forms a wish, may no one find out about me. He twists around in his body, by, he twists around by speech or mind. He piles up his evil, unwholesome deeds in one way or another, repeatedly. These unwise, this unwise evildoer, knowing his own misdeeds, is a poor person who falls into debt, troubled while enjoying himself. His thoughts then prosecute him. Painful mental states born of remorse follow him wherever he goes, whether in the village or in the forest. This unwise evildoer, knowing his own misdeeds, goes to a certain animal realm or even bound in hell. This indeed is discontentedness of bondage. Okay, thank you, Dwight. So here the Buddha is comparing going into debt and having these unwise decisions that we make by body, speech, and mind is like going into debt. Because if you've ever gone into any kind of significant debt, then you realize what's really happening is you're going deeper and deeper and deeper into this hole while you're sitting there enjoying yourself because you have all these cravings to buy things that you can't otherwise uh, afford. And you might be putting them on a credit card or borrowing money from friends or what have you. And now you're enjoying all these different things, but you're actually harming yourself yourself. You're actually putting yourself in this prison of indebtedness. And that's what the Buddha is describing, that while you're yearning and longing for these central pleasures and you're going into this debt, you're actually going into debt and harming yourself, troubling yourself while enjoying yourself. And then the same thing he's describing in terms of misconduct by body, speech, and mind, that you're hoping that nobody finds out about the, the harmful things that you're doing, but while you're doing those harmful things repeatedly, one after another after another, you're going into debt because you're producing all this unwholesome gamma. As you're producing unwise decisions that's leading to unwholesome gamma, you're going to have to experience that before you get to enlightenment. There's no way for you to run and hide from your gamma. So the more unwise decisions you make that are producing unwholesome results, you're just extending the amount of time that it takes for you to get to enlightenment. And if you're currently making a bunch of unwise decisions, it's okay. That's where you're at. Just don't allow your mind to get complacent. Continue to read, continue to come to classes, continue to meditate, get help from your teacher for personal guidance. And slowly but surely, you'll ramp down your unwise decisions, thus your unwholesome gamma, and you'll gradually ramp up your wise decisions and your wholesome gamma. And where those two things meet, you really break through and start experiencing more and more wholesome results in your life. But it takes a significant amount of time to cultivate the wisdom and develop your practice such that you're making more and more and more wise decisions. Oftentimes the mind is very worried about the decisions that you're making that are producing unwholesome results. Well, there's something called moral wrongdoing and moral concern. This is very important to understand. What moral wrongdoing is, this is the Buddha's teaching. He talks about moral wrongdoing as understanding essentially what's right from wrong or wholesome and unwholesome, that you need to cultivate those qualities of understanding what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. This is called moral wrongdoing. 
Now what moral concern is, is now that you know what's wholesome and unwholesome, that you have concern to not do the unwholesome and to arise the wholesome. And these are certain qualities of mind that you need to develop. Sometimes people have so much moral concern that they become worried about every last little harmful thing that they do. Now in this situation, it can be a self-defeating uh, you know, situation, a kind of self-sabotage where you just kind of stumble and stumble and stumble and stumble and it's hard to get your feet under you. So as you see yourself making unwise decisions and it's producing unwholesome results, that one of the best things to do is to step back, kind of put a pause on things, kind of step back and make no decisions at all. Think about what's going on. Think about the situations that you're involved in. Think about the decisions that you've been making and try to cultivate wisdom. If that's reading books, if that's coming to class, if that's reaching out to your teacher for more guidance, put a pause on things that you're doing in life. Step back, try to cultivate some wisdom and then go back into the situations that you are faced with. Whether that's a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you're going to sometimes need to step back and look at things from afar and try to assess what's going on in your life. But if you stay in those situations where a lot of unwholesome gum is coming back to you and you just keep making decision after decision after decision, you're just potentially producing more and more unwholesome gamma because you're making unwise decisions. When your mind is unsettled, when it's shaken up and unsteady, when you've got discontentedness, you're going to tend to make unwise decisions. So by putting a pause on things and stepping back and making no decisions at all, you're not producing any unwholesome gamma. In most situations, when you stop making decisions, you're gonna stop you know, producing unwholesome gamma, except for in the situations where I mentioned about where you're maybe ignoring your children and certain conduct that they're involved in. But even in that situation, sometimes it's wise to step back, look at what your children are doing, wait a couple of hours or a couple of days until you calm down, and then connect with them and help them see where they're having challenges and where they need to improve. So if you're overly worried about your misdeeds, then you need to kind of gain your composure and realize that the only way to escape all of that is to cultivate wisdom so that you can improve the condition of your mind and make wiser decisions. And sometimes that involves stepping back. What questions do you guys have on this particular chapter? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. So let's go ahead and move on to the next chapter. Is there someone in Zoom that would like to read this one? Okay, go ahead, Marcy. Four kinds of persons. At Savatai, the perfectly enlightened one then said to King Pasadini of Salah, great king, there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What for? One heading from darkness to darkness, one heading from darkness to light, one heading from light to darkness, and one heading from light to light. And how, great king, is a person one heading from darkness to darkness? Here, some person has been reborn in a low family, a family of Kalid Kalidalas, bamboo workers, hunters, cartwrights, or waste collectors, a poor family in which there is little food and drink, and which substance was difficult, one where food and clothing are attained with difficulty, and he is unsightly, deformed, chronically blind or crippled, handed, or lame or paralyzed. He is not one who gains food, drink, clothing, and vehicles, garlands, scents, and ointments, bedding, housing, and lightning. He engages in misconduct of body, speech, and mind. Having do, done so with the breakup of the body, after death, he is reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the netherworld, in hell, Suppose, great king, a man would go from darkness to darkness or from gloom to gloom, from stain to stain, this person I say is exactly similar. It is in this way, great king, that a person is one heading from darkness to darkness. And how, great king, is a person heading from darkness to light? 
Here, some person has been reborn in a low family, a family of Caldalize, bamboo workers, hunters, cartwrights, a waste collectors, a poor family in which there is little food and drink, which subsets, subsets with difficulty. One where food and clothing are obtained with difficulty. He is ugly, unsightly, deformed, chronically blind or crippled handed or lame or paralyzed. He is not one who gains food, drink, clothing, and vehicles, garlands, scents, ointments, bedding, housing, lightning. He engages in wholesome conduct of body, speech, and mind. Having done so with the break of the body after death, he was reborn in a good destination in the heavenly world. Suppose, great king, a man would climb from the ground to the peliquin, pel peliquin, or from a peliquin to the horseback, or from horseback to an elephant mount, from an elephant mount to a mansion. This person I say exactly similar. In this way, great king, that person is one heading from darkness to light. And how, great king, is a person heading from the light to the darkness? Here, some person is... It, here, some person has been reborn in the high family, an influential case family, a fluent Brahma family, a fluent household, householder family, one which is rich with great wealth and property, with abundant gold and silver, abundant treasures and com commodities, abundant wealth and grain. And he is handsome, attractive, graceful, posing supreme beauty of complexion, he is one who gains food, drink, clothing, vehicles, garlands, scents, and ointments, bedding, housing, and lighting. He engages in misconduct of the body, speech, and mind. Having done so with the breakup of the body after death, he is reborn in the plain of misery, in a bad destination, and the netherworld in hell. Suppose, great king, a man would descend from a mansion to an elephant mount, or from an elephant mount to horseback, from horseback to a peliquin, from a peliquin to the ground, or from the ground to the underground darkness. This person, I say, is exactly similar. In this way, great king, that a person is one heading from light to darkness. And how, great king, is a person heading from light to light? Here, some person has been born in a high family, an affluent K family, an affluent Brahma family, an affluent household family one which is rich with great wealth and property with abundant gold and silver abundant treasures and commodities with abundant wealth and grain and he is handsome attractive graceful possessing supreme beauty of a complexion he is one who gains food drink clothing vehicles garland scented ointments bedding housing and lightning he engages in wholesome conduct of the body speech and mind Having done so with the breakup of the body after death, he is reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. Suppose a great king, a man would cross over from peliquin to peliquin, from horseback to horseback, from elephant mount to elephant mount, from mansion to mansion. This person I say is exactly similar. In this way, great king, that a person is one heading from light to light. These great king are the four kinds found existing in the world. All right. Thank you, Marcy. It's really helpful to understand what was going on during the lifetime of the Buddha to be able to understand these types of discourses is that during his lifetime, it was taught that if you were born into a high affluent family, that you were born and you know determined to experience greatness. Whereas if you were born into a family that lacks resources, that you were born and your destiny was to experience, you know, a very difficult uh, life. Well, when the Buddha came in, and, and of course, he knew that these things were occurring in society, that, you know, people that were born with lower resources were just kind of almost giving up on life, where the people in affluent families were thinking that they were so great and wonderful and, you know, kind of having the run of the world, so to speak. So the Buddha was helping people to see that it's not based on where you're born and what family you're born into. It's based on the wisdom that you acquire in life and based on your decisions and how you conduct yourself and the actions that you take by body, speech, and mind, which determines what type of life that you were having. And that one could be 
be born into a lower family of, of what they're describing as a lower family, one who lacks resources, and you could go towards the darkness. Or you could be born into a family that has a lack of resources and you could walk towards the light. And then conversely, you could be born into a family that has significant resources and you could head to the darkness. And you could be born into a family with significant resources and head towards the light. And that's what he's explaining here and helping people see that what you're experiencing in life is the result of your decisions, not where you're born. Where you're born is your old gamma from your previous lives. And now what you're trying to do in this life is extinguish all all your unwholesome gamma, no matter whether it was from a previous life or whether it was from this life, you're interested in extinguishing all your unwholesome gamma. So if you were born into a family that lacks resources, okay, this is your gamma from your previous life, but now you need to overcome that obstacle and build up your skills and ability to the point where you can sustain your life, provide for your basic necessities, and then be able to have the opportunity to learn and practice these teachings. And if you're born into a family that has a lot of resources, you shouldn't allow that to go to waste Instead, understand that this is based on your previous decisions in your previous lives. And now, rather than head towards the darkness, continue to improve your life. Use this as a way to continue to propel yourself in life so that you can then focus on learning and practicing, training your mind and getting to enlightenment. But where you're born is your old gamma. And if you're having any uh, unwholesome results based on where you've been born and what family you've been born into, whether they lack resources or lack wisdom or whether you've been born into a harsh, disgruntled and difficult existence. OK, that's what you've been born into. But now let's work to overcome those obstacles so that you can experience this peace and this calm serenity and contentedness with joy, which is the enlightened mind in terms of the um, cycle of rebirth and being reborn into the lower realms. As I mentioned, I just suggest people to set that to the side. And the same thing in terms of being reborn into uh, improved rebirth, in terms of heavenly realm and improved human existence, I suggest people set that to the side too. Know that it's uh, what the Buddha is describing, it is the natural law of gamma, but what your goal should be is to get to enlightenment in this life. And just know that if you fall short of that, you will experience an improved rebirth. But you're not interested in walking to the darkness because that's going to lead to let more and more difficulties in this life and it's going to lead to a uh, less interesting or less desirable, uh, you know, less agreeable existence in a future life. So just focus on this current life, training your mind, cultivating wisdom and getting to enlightenment in this life. And just understand that the Buddha is saying that you can move within this human realm, you know, forward, backwards, left, right. It really depends on your wisdom and the decisions that you make. Let me see what questions you guys might have on this chapter. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. So let's move to the next one. All right, uh, Marcy, would you like to? Oh, actually, this one is the Eightfold Path. So what I usually do in this program is I uh, share a little bit here, but I teach more details on the Eightfold Path in the group learning program. The group learning program is the first program that I teach as a foundational program. It's actually restarting from the very beginning tomorrow. And that's where I teach the Eightfold Path in detail because it's a foundational teaching that students would need in order to develop their ability to progress on the path to enlightenment. And when we get to it, in this particular program, there's a few places where it shows up. I just remind people about the Eightfold Path and give you an opportunity to ask any and all questions that you like because you're usually dialing this in closer and closer. Here, if you notice, instead of titling it as the Eightfold Path, it's titled The Path to Attain the Ending of Unwholesome Gamma because what you're trying to do in this life in order to get to enlightenment is extinguish your unwholesome gamma and it's the full path that is going to allow you to accomplish that the buddha is teaching you how to produce only wholesome gamma by making wise decisions and dialing in these eight steps closer and closer so you've got right view right intention right speech right action right livelihood right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And if you have any questions on any of these steps, let me know and I will answer those for you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, there's Marcy, you got a question, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Teacher David. 
Um, when you were ex explaining, and the Buddha speaks of rebirth, but we can also, because I have experiences where we can experience our karma in this life. So if we don't really focus on the rebirth, we can focus on the fact that if we have right speech, if we have right action, we can experience the wholesome benefit from that in this life by practicing a wholesome way, correct? Yes, 100%. And that's what you're doing to extinguish your unwholesome karma. So if you were born into this life and say you were born into a family that's kind of hostile and aggressive and you grew up with that around you and you started to conform to that because you're a child and you don't know anything different, you're just around people that are hostile and aggressive and that's the way that you talk and you're argumentative or using harsh speech. And if that's what you grew up with, that's what you've adopted in your mind because your mind's conditioned in that way because we tend to conform to what's going on around us. But now in this life, when we learn that that's unwise, we can then train our mind to now speak with right speech. And then that's going to extinguish our unwholesome karma of having been reborn into a hostile and harsh family that now we in our life are going to now choose to speak loving and kind and gentle. And now our children and our life partner and the people around us are all speaking this way because that's the way we're choosing to speak. And we can create a better life for ourselves that was different than what we grew up with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Let me see if there's any other questions here. That actually helps probably Chrissy too, based on some of the things she was talking about and asking about. All right, so in this particular chapter, not only is the full path shared, but then there's details on right action that's also shared as well. And then there's details on uh, right action here as well, that the Buddha is sharing some deeper understanding of right action. And then there's some details on right uh, livelihood or wrong livelihood as well. And these are all things that I share in the group learning program. But if you guys have any questions on these, remember this program is more like you're coming to class as a study group and getting advice and guidance and seeking guidance. So if you've been reading these before class, you might have questions on these and feel free to ask questions on any of these. And then we're just kind of summarizing the teachings. But if you're reading these books, you can see that I'm sharing details here that are helping you to be able to understand these. But the Buddha talks very clear, very concise and very precise, but it does help to have a dedicated practitioner and teacher guide you in your learning and development. Okay, so now we go to chapter 38. Marcy, would you like to read this one? Sure. With the destruction of craving comes the destruction of unwholesome karma. Monks. Develop the path and the way that leads to the destruction of craving. And what is the path and the way that leads to the destruction of craving? It is the seven factors of enlightenment. What seven? The enlightenment factors of mindfulness, the enlightenment factors of investigation, the enlightenment factors of energy, the enlightenment factors of joy, the enlightenment factors of tranquility, the enlightenment factors of concentration, the enlightenment factors of equanimity. When this was said, the venerable Undai asked the perfectly enlightened one, Venerable Sir, how are the seven factors of enlightenment developed and cultivated so that they lead to the destruction of craving? Here, Undai, a monk develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion, freedom from strong feelings, and elimination, maturing in release, which is immense, superb, measurableness without ill will. When he develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion, freedom from strong feelings, and elimination, maturing in release, which is immense, superb, measureless without ill will, craving is abandoned. With the abandoning of craving, unwholesome karma is abandoned. With the abandoning of unwholesome karma, discontentedness is abandoned. All of the seven factors of enlightenment are explained in the same way to include the enlightenment factor of investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, and concentration, with the final factor being described in the same way as, as in the below. He develops the enlightenment factor of equanimity, it was based upon seclusion, freedom of strong feelings, and elimination, maturing and release, 
which is immense, superb, measureless, without ill will. When he develops the enlightenment factor of equanimity, which is based upon seclusion, freedom from strong feelings and elimination, maturing and release, which is immense, superb, measurable, measurableless, without ill will, craving is abandoned. With the abandoning of craving, unwholesome karma is abandoned. With the abandoning of unwholesome karma, discontentedness is abandoned. Thus, undai. With the destruction of craving comes the destruction of unwholesome karma. With the destruction of unwholesome karma comes the destruction of discontentedness. Okay, thank you, Marcy. So here the Buddha is kind of introducing the seven factors of enlightenment and helping you to understand how they eliminate this unwholesome karma. Because what the seven factors of enlightenment are is there to fine tune the mind and help you bring the mind to the middle. Oftentimes people think the five, I'm sorry, the seven factors of enlightenment are to determine whether or not you are enlightened or you're not enlightened. That's not what they actually are. They're a tool to fine tune the mind. With mindfulness being the first factor of enlightenment, this is the awareness of mind, those four foundations of mindfulness that I've taught in other classes. You need to be practicing awareness of mind at all times. In order to train your mind on the path to enlightenment, you need to practice breathing mindfulness meditation to practice and cultivate mindfulness or awareness of mind and specifically those four foundations of mindfulness in the mind. But then you need to practice awareness of mind and understanding and having awareness of those four foundations of mindfulness in daily life. Because by having awareness of your mind, you'll be able to see the unwholesome quality that are there and you'll be able to apply right effort and eliminate them and then when you're seeing the wholesome qualities you'll be able to apply right effort and support those encouraging those and not allowing them to fade and it's the teachings of the Buddha that are going to help you to be able to understand what is wholesome and what is unwholesome but you need to have cultivated mindfulness to be able to observe the awareness of mind so that you can then decide to either take action to eliminate the unwholesome or to arise the wholesome and one of the things you might observe with mindfulness is you might observe that the mind is complacent or dull or lethargic. And as you do, you practice the enlightenment factor of investigation, energy, and joy. And I teach you in the group learning program as part of the foundational teachings, what those factors are and how to actually practice them. And then when you see the mind in that excited, elated state, you practice tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. That's what brings it down into the middle. So as long as you allow the mind to be dull and lethargic and complacent, you're not gonna feel uh, the peacefulness and joy there. And as long as you allow the mind to be excited and elated and thrilled, you're not gonna find the peacefulness and joy there either. The mind's overactive. So you need to bring it to the middle and it's these seven factors of enlightenment that are gonna help you do that. With mindfulness being practiced all the time, and with tranquility, I'm sorry, with investigation, energy, and joy being practiced to lift it up out of complacency, and with tranquility, concentration, equanimity, bringing it out of the excitement into the middle. So you're gonna to need to understand what these seven factors are, and I just taught a class on this last week on Sunday that goes into these seven factors in detail and explains to you how to practice them. So if you need help with learning what these are, you can reference that on Facebook, YouTube, or in our podcast, and you can see that I taught the five hindrances in the seven factors of enlightenment, and there you'll be able to learn about them. And you'll find the details of the seven factors of enlightenment in volume one, chapter three, and I probably even have them in here as well. Yep, here they are. So I have them in this chapter as well, where you can see what the seven factors of enlightenment are. And then as you need help to learn how to practice, you can ask questions in class, you can post in the Facebook group, you can send me a private message, or you can schedule personal guidance and I will help you understand how to apply these in daily life. So let me see what questions you guys have on this one. Okay, Marcy, go ahead, what's your question? The teacher David, um... You know, this being Marcy has been um, obviously practicing mindfulness and being aware of the mind. And, and I've been becoming very aware of like bodily sensations. So I've, you know, I've been working really because I have these episodes of where I get really elated very easily and I've been ap applying equanimity. But now I find myself when I'm, when I, as soon as I feel the bodily sensation come on, I'm applying the equanimity to kind of bring myself down. My actual, physical response of my face and my verbal is almost 
very like mundane. And I don't know if I'm over applying it or am I just, just now the mind is just searching to find that balance because I don't want to let myself get, you know, to get, to take those bodily sensations to become into feelings and all of that. So I'm cutting them there mm -hmm. and I'm applying that equanimity, but then I almost feel like I'm, <laughs> I don't want to say dead inside, but like very like mundane. Ooh. Yeah, this is normal as you're training your mind is that the mind is almost like a pendulum. When it swings to one side and you're getting all excited and you start cutting that back and restraining the mind, the mind doesn't just go right to the middle, right? It just kind of, it kind of swings to the other side where you can kind of feel dull and lethargic or as you're describing mundane. So it kind of swings and it kind of more and more you can kind of fine tune the mind and bring it into the middle. So if you're noticing that you're overshooting the middle and you're finding that you're moving towards that dullness or that mundaneness that you're describing, that's where you then bring in the investigation, the energy and the joy to bring the mind back closer to the middle. But if you overshoot that and now you go up into the excited part, that's where you bring in the tranquility, concentration, equanimity. And more and more as you fine tune this and you get the mind to be in the middle for longer and longer periods, you'll know that your mind is in the middle when it's in the middle and you'll know when it's not and you'll catch it sooner and sooner and you'll be able to bring it back to the middle and the longer you can keep it in the middle that's where the meditation is so important and then maintaining your mindfulness in daily life that if you can maintain this middle for longer and longer periods of time eventually the mind will just always stay in the middle but it's going to pop out from time to time as you're making your way to enlightenment just catch it as soon as you can and then understand if you're feeling dull lethargic or you're calling it mundane bring in those three factors of investigation, energy, and joy. And if you're feeling that you're going to excitement, bring in the tranquility, concentration, equanimity, and try to maintain your calmness and composure in the middle for longer and longer periods of time. So, Teacher David, may I provide you an example so I can understand which um, I would apply when I get that feeling? So someone is telling me a story and I start to get this bodily sensation of, you know, like, oh, this is very exciting. So then I apply the equanimity to kind of bring myself back. And then they're expecting a response or I want to respond. But my response is very almost like I don't care what they said. But it's not like I don't care what they said. I, I do care. I am interested. But it's not. Would I apply? But then I would I apply joy to that to try to show show feeling of like i am interested i don't know if i'm making myself clear <laughs> you're making yourself clear i just have a question for you are you reading something that somebody's saying to you and saying like oh you don't even care what i'm saying or are they having some craving for a specific response and when they're not getting that are they getting upset with you or what's happening there so I'm just going to give you the exact example. So today Vinny was telling me about um, one of his one of his knives that he has for work and what the cost was. And I'm a very, very frugal person, so I enjoy hearing when people save money. But I get a bodily sensation when I start to hear about the savings. So then he told me about how another company, the same knife, is sold at a higher price. And I just kind of applied equanimity instead of getting excited about the fact that he saved like 60 bucks i just was like uh-huh and then let it go and then he kind of just was looking at me like i didn't really even hear what he said mm -hmm. okay so in that situation he's having a craving for a certain response your response was what your response was and if he was displeased with what your response was that's due to his craving you didn't do anything harmful in that situation you're just like uh-huh okay no big deal like or you didn't say no big deal but you know you're just like okay you know you just acknowledged that you heard what he had to say but it sounds like to me that he was expecting a certain response he didn't get that and then he looked at you like you know hey what gives why did you just say uh-huh so you shouldn't feel obligated to respond in any particular way you need to look at right speech and say did i practice right speech well if you're just like uh-huh or okay you practice right speech. You spoke at the right time. What you said is true. You spoke gentle. You spoke beneficially. And you spoke with a mind of loving kindness. You didn't cause any harm there. So in this situation, he's just wanting a certain response or expecting a certain response like, oh, wow, you're so great. You got a savings. You shouldn't feel an obligation to fulfill someone else's craving. If they're getting frustrated or irritated or any displeasure at all, they're causing it due to their own craving. 
All right. I mean, because I, I mean, I again, I think he's used to me when it comes to saving money. I usually have a very more, um, I guess, theatrical response to it. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's great when you save money. That's wonderful. But I'm really trying to practice being in the middle and not letting myself feel that energy that I get from saving money. Right. And where you just said he's used to me reacting in this way, that's his mind craving permanence. His mind wants the same response from you every time. And what you have done is you haven't done anything unwise or unwholesome. His mind is just craving that permanence of every time I tell her I save money, I get the that a boy, good boy, great job. And I want that. And now I'm craving that. And when I don't get that, I don't feel good. But you're not causing that frustration. It's his mind craving that permanent reaction from you that he's used to. And now that he's not getting what he's used to, which is the craving, and he's craving permanence. Now he's getting this impermanence, which is, uh-huh. And he's, you know, experiencing some displeasure with that. So you're not causing the displeasure. You're just responding and however you're responding. So his mind just has to get used to. Sometimes you're going to say, oh, great. That's a, uh, excellent. You save money. In other cases, you're just going to say, uh-huh. Okay. Right. So there's nothing wrong okay. with what you're doing. It's just that his mind is craving the permanence. Okay. Thank you, teacher David. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yep. You're welcome. I'm going to check our social media and see if there's any more questions. Okay, I'm not seeing anything there. So let's go on to the next one, which is chapter 39. You can go ahead and read this one if you like, Marcy, or I can read it. No, I can read it. Let me see it real quick. I think this might be a really long one. Uh, it's not too long. Uh, let me see what the next one is, too. I'm just looking at the time because I like to be aware of y'all's time. Um, how about I read this one and you read the next one, Marcy? Sure. Okay, I'll read this one. So this one is chapter 39. Anyone can produce Nibbana, enlightenment. And what, Ananda, are the six classes? One, here, someone of the black class produces a black state. Someone of a black class produces a white state. Someone of the black class produces Nibbana, enlightenment, which is neither black nor white. Then, someone of the white class produces a black state. Someone of the white class produces a white state. And someone of the white class produces Nibbana, enlightenment, which is neither black nor white. Okay, I'm going to explain to you guys what we're going to read here. What we're going to read here is something very similar to what we read before. The Buddha is just describing it in a different way. He's describing how you can move from a family with a lack of resources to enlightenment, or you can move from a family of of uh, significant resources to enlightenment because remember he's trying to help people see it doesn't matter where you're born you can get to enlightenment and oftentimes people think that it's only ordained practitioners that can get to enlightenment or you have to be some kind of holy person to get to enlightenment but it doesn't matter where you're born and what you've experienced in life you can get to enlightenment during the lifetime of the buddha there was an individual who had killed 999 people and he got to enlightenment during his lifetime, learning with the Buddha. So I know no matter what you've done in life, you haven't killed 999 people. And that means you can get to enlightenment, right? So you can think of it that way, that no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're speaking harsh or aggressive or you, uh, you know, maybe discipline your children with hitting them and you're trying to work on not doing that any longer, or whether you've had uh, substances that cause heedlessness or you've had sexual uh, misconduct or what have you, you can overcome all of those things. And that's what the Buddha is essentially talking about here. So I'm not going to go ahead and read the whole entire thing, but just understand that that's what he's describing. And you can read it and he goes into detail and helping you understand that's what he's actually describing. And then I help you understand it here as well. So let me see if there's any questions here on this one. Okay, it looks like we have a question coming in from Bruce. When applying the different factors, this is related to the last chapter, when applying the different factors to keep the mind in the middle, I kind of feel like I have neither joy nor unwholesome feelings. It's like I unintentionally cut off all the feelings and emotions. How do I not do that? So this is very similar to the answer I gave Marcy, that as you're learning to navigate this enlightened mind and try to acquire this enlightened mind, that you tend to overshoot the middle. 
in one direction or another. And you kind of go through that for a period of time where you're so used to basing your inner feelings on cravings, desires, attachments. We're so used to chasing those pleasant feelings that when we're cutting off those pleasant feelings and trying to bring the mind to the middle, remember they're conditioned pleasant feelings. And we're trying to bring the mind to the middle. We oftentimes overshoot it and the mind ends up in painful feelings like sadness or other painful feelings. So and sometimes you get to the point where you feel like you have no feelings at all. And that might be kind of what, Bruce, you're talking about here, where you almost kind of feel numb inside sometimes and you kind of feel dull and lethargic, perhaps. So when you're noticing this, this isn't what you would like to do. You would like to bring the mind more to the middle. So if you're noticing that you don't have the joy in the mind, you would like to arise that enlightenment factor of joy and bring it to the middle. If you're noticing that you're having excitement, you would like to bring the mind to the middle. And now more and more, when you get the mind to the middle and you experience what that's like, then you can navigate that and you can uh, feel comfortable because you'll feel the peace and the joy in the mind and your mind will tend to stay there more readily. So wherever you see that you have overshot it, then do apply the antidote, which depending on which side you've gotten to on from the middle, either the dull side or the excited side, you're going to have to arise particular enlightenment factors, either investigation, energy or joy to bring it out of that dull and lethargic or, you know, just kind of complacent or mundane state that Marcy was talking about. Or if you're in that excited state, you need to apply those other factors of tranquility, concentration and equanimity. You are going to overshoot the middle and you need to do that in order to gain the wisdom that you have overshot the middle. So you don't apply too much of one particular enlightenment factor or another, you're really tweaking, you're really dialing in these dials as close as possible. And where you see that you have overshot it, then just bring in the other ones. And that's why you'd like to have these seven factors of enlightenment in your back pocket as a tool and technique to help you. All right, you're welcome, Bruce. Pleased to, to help you there. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions anywhere else. So Marcy, how about you read this last one here? Sure. The rising of discontentedness. I have said, Ananda, the discon that discontentedness is dependently arisen. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. If one were to speak thus, one would be stating what has been said by me and would not misrepresent me with what is contrary to the truth. One would explain in accordance with the teachings and no reasonable consequence of one's assertion would give grounds for criticism. Therein, Ananda, in the case of those aesthetics and Brahmins, advocates of Kama, who maintain, this dis maintain that discontentedness is created by oneself that is conditioned by contact. Also, in the case of those aesthetic and Brahmins, advocates of Kama, who maintain that discontentedness is created by another, that too is conditioned by contact. Also, in the case of those aesthetics and Brahmins, advocates of Kama, who maintain that discontentedness is created by both oneself and by another, that too is conditioned by contact. Also, in the case of those aesthetic and Brahmins, advocates of Kama, who maintain that discontentedness has arisen randomly being created neither by oneself nor by another, that too is conditioned by contact. Okay, thank you, Marcy. So here, this takes some understanding of dependent origination, which is something that we studied in volume five, chapter 14, and understanding how this central desire that's in the mind is longing and yearning through the six sense bases, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body and the mind. And there's this longing and yearning for agreeable contact through the six sense bases. And if the mind gets its cravings fulfilled and you get agreeable contact, then you get conditioned pleasant feelings. But if you get disagreeable contact based on your cravings, then now you're gonna get the painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, and others. So what the Buddha is saying is in order for you to experience any discontentedness in your mind, it's going to come through one of these six doorways. There needs to be contact through one of these six doorways. So if you see agreeable things, 
then you'll get pleasant feelings. Those are conditioned pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But if you see a gr disagreeable things, then you will get the painful feelings of anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, and others. And the only reason why the mind sees things as either agreeable or disagreeable is because of craving, desire, attachment. When the craving, desire, attachment is there, that longing and yearning, you're going to see certain things as agreeable to you and you're going to see certain things as disagreeable. But by the time you eradicate and eliminate craving, desire, attachment, you won't see it as agreeable or disagreeable. It's just contact. So let me give you an example. If you're sitting at a traffic light in your car and someone pulls up in a car next to you and they're blaring their music and you're like, oh, wow, that's my jam. Yeah, that's my music, right? You have a certain craving, a certain attachment that you see that as agreeable contact through the ears. You're hearing certain sounds, you find it agreeable and now these pleasant feelings arise. But now you pull up to the next traffic light and someone's blaring some music that you despise and you think it's horrible. And now you disagree with this music and now you get frustrated and irritated and annoyed, right? Well, what you would like to do is get rid of that craving and realize there's certain music that you prefer, but you're not gonna allow the music that you would rather not listen to to shake up your mind. So now you pull up to a light and somebody pulls up to the music or in a car with music that you prefer, it's like, oh wow, that's some pretty good music. You know, that guy's got some good taste or that girl's got some good taste, excellent. And now you pull up to another light and somebody's got some music that you don't prefer. It's like, all right, well, this is impermanent. You know, they're having fun, good for them. Look at them jamming out. Rather than being disgruntled or angry, you know, you can look at them and have sympathetic joy and be like, wow, they really like that music. You know, look at them having fun. Rather than being, you know, hateful and vindictive, that this this person has pulled up with some music that you don't prefer just understand that this music is temporary the light's going to turn green they're going to be gone in about two or three minutes or four minutes right so rather than sit there with your craving and get these conditioned pleasant feelings when you hear something great that you like and then if you allow the mind to do that you, it's only a matter of time before you hear something that you don't like so just look at it as contact there's some sound coming into the ear that's all it is, is it's just sound. It doesn't have to be agreeable or disagreeable. And the same thing with your eyes, your nose, your tongue, the body itself in the mind. There's various things that you're experiencing that right now you might look at it as agreeable or disagreeable, but as you dissolve your cravings and eliminate your cravings, you can just look at it as contact and you don't need to agree or disagree with this contact. It's just contact coming in through the sense spaces. And as long as you understand that, now you can more readily get your arms around this. And what the Buddha is saying here is that there are certain people that disagree with gamma. And during his lifetime, there were people who disagreed with it or people who uh, think that, you know, gamma is created in one way or another. And he's explaining all these different ways that people believed that gamma was being created or discontentedness was being created. And he's helping you to see that all these other theories and all these other approaches are not the truth. That in order for you to experience discontentedness, it's got to come through one of these six doorways. And that means it's conditioned on contact. And now that you've learned this, you don't believe it. You reflect on it through your own direct experiences and what you've experienced in life. And then you practice it and you see the truth for yourself that anytime your mind gets discontent, it's based on contact. So by you eliminating your cravings, desires, attachments, you can get to the point where you just see it as contact. It's not agreeable or disagreeable. And then you can reside peaceful and joyful, no longer having certain cravings. But your cravings are gonna need to be triggered in a number of situations for you to be able to observe it and for you to be able to cut it off and let it go. So in this example with the music and a car pulling up next to you, if you see those conditioned pleasant feelings coming into the mind, cut those off as a bodily sensation. Don't allow it to become a conditioned feeling. And same thing, if you 
have some music that comes up next to you and you start noticing the painful feelings starting to arise. Cut those off. Don't allow the mind to get those conditioned pleasant feelings so that then you can just reside peaceful and joyful no matter what's happening around you. Despite this sound of music, you can maintain your calmness and composure. You can maintain your peace and your joy. But as long as you have a certain craving, wanting the world to be a certain way, you're gonna have certain conditions that if the music sounds like this, I will be happy. If the music sounds like this, I'm going to be angry and frustrated. And you would like to just get rid of those cravings and realize that you can't control this world and what you hear and what you don't hear. In some situations, you're going to be in situations where you hear things that maybe you find uh, disagreeable. But if you get rid of that craving, you won't see it as disagreeable anymore. You'll just see it as contact. And now you can maintain your calmness and composure regardless of what contact you're experiencing, whether it's through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, or the mind itself looking to the past or looking to the future. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and I'll see your questions. Okay, let's see. I don't see any questions in YouTube or Facebook, and I don't see any questions in Zoom either. So it looks like these are all the questions that we've had for today, and this is all the chapters for today. Our next class, we're going to be finishing out this book of the Natural Law of Gamma, Volume 6. We're going to be in chapters 41, and I think it goes to either 45 or 46, but you'll see through the end of the book. If you download this book from buddhadailywisdom.com, you'll see the link there if you go to that website where you can download all the books, where this book, Volume 6, if you read chapters 41 through the end of the book, then you'll be prepared for next excuse me, for next week's class. And then I'll be going through and helping you guys to learn the individual chapters. Next week, we'll be doing meditation together, which you guys know that usually I start with meditation at the beginning of these classes. But the last few classes, I haven't been able to do that because the chapters are quite long. But next week, since we have a shorter number of chapters, we'll be able to do meditation together at the beginning of our class. And then tomorrow in our group learning program, we're going to be starting from the very beginning. If you haven't studied with me before or you're just starting to get access to these resources, that's a great place for you to start because from there, volume one, I'm going to be laying down a really solid foundation for you to learn the teachings of the Buddha. You can actually be learning both programs at the same time. There's no harm in doing that. But oftentimes students will like to learn in the group learning program first and then move into the Pali Canon and English study group. But some students choose to do them both at the same time, it really comes down to the amount of time that you have to dedicate to your learning and growth. But tomorrow, the 13th of August, I'm going to be starting from the very beginning with the very beginning of the group learning program, which is a seven month program. And we meet each Sunday and Wednesday. And if for any reason you're missing class, which over a seven month period, I'm sure you will miss a class here and there, they're all recorded. So on Monday or Tuesday or other days, you can go to Facebook, YouTube, or our podcast, and you can take in the content that you missed. And then all the books are available for download for free. You can take that book and go print it if you like, or you can order printed versions off of Amazon, because if your country has access to Amazon, you can get the printed versions there. So thank you all for joining for today's class. We'll see you guys in one of these future classes, either a future Pali Canon in English study group, the group learning program, or any of these other courses and retreats that I teach here in Thailand. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee
thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.